Good evening. Welcome to Right Talk with Mike Lee. This, I, this is, I believe, my 13th show. Now, sometimes around they say that 13 is supposed to be an unlucky number, but I think this is a very lucky number for me because I have two outstanding gentlemen with me whom I admire and respect very, very much, who have, I believe, have a lot of information and perspectives to impart that could be helpful to the audience. I'll, I'll, I'll take off my Black Panther stuff and so everybody can relax. On my right is State Representative James White. On my left is my, one of my favorite guests, Mr. Robert Muhammad from the Nation of Islam. And I want to talk to you guys today about just what's going on in politics, really. They're both nationally, statewide, and locally. Mm. Now, James and I, we met some years ago. Years ago. We met where? Decades. Probably in the decades, huh? We were bunking together in a hotel or something, wasn't we? In so, San Antonio. In San Antonio, right. We met through Jim Bowie, right? Mm-hmm. Great, great black Republican. Yep. And Robert and I have met since I've been in Austin. And uh, mm -hmm. I'm very supportive of his events because I believe that we as conservatives should do what we can to reach out to all parts of the community. You know what I say, Robert. What's good for the black community is good for who? I don't good know. Good for the community. It's good for the community. I was going to say America. Yeah, okay. You, you, there you, you go. You there always, you go. You always run with it. I just said what's yeah, good yeah, for yeah. the black community is good for the community. Yeah. Robert says it's good for the country and good for the America and good for the world. That's right. Now, I think we're in a situation now where nationally it's getting all the attention because the recently elected president, Mr. Trump, looks like to me he's not playing. He looks like he's going to actually do what he says. And he's really not behaving like a politician. Usually, it seems to me that when you get a little pushback, someone goes, takes a position to be a little more unlike, a little more popular. Okay. But that doesn't seem to me like what's happening. How do you see that, James? Well, this is it's, it's very interesting, uh, President Trump and how he is uh, behaving. Um, I think his approval rating, based on some of these polls, and maybe fake news, but regardless of the fact that some of the polls have him around 45, 47 percent. But if you look at the other players on the political battlefield, Congress, their opinion rating is at 13 percent and the press is somewhere in the tank too. So he just can continue doing what he's doing because he's beating both the establishment in Congress and the press. Well, he was at 36 at one point, wasn't he? Well, was well, that 36. was probably during the, during the election, but some of the latest reports I've seen, he's, he's been at 45, but again, Congress is at 13, the press is probably at 13 in the single digits too, so he should just keep running the same play. I mean, he's, he's up, on both of them. These are rough times, I guess, in politics. You, and, and, and the deal is this, Mike, he does not care about being popular. He cares about getting a job done, the job that he believes that he was elected to do. So being at 45%, 47%, 57%, 77%, 37%, none of that matters to him. Well, that's kind of like what it was just before the election, wasn't it? Was he like around that 45, 47 range? And, and it is and just... steadily it's, been there. Yeah, and, and, and he's just going to do what he's going to do. Um, he knows the, co the electoral coalition he needs to keep, and he'll just keep running the same play to keep that coalition together and get reelected in four years. How do you see that, Robert? How do you see the things shaking out? Well, you know, uh, you know, looking at Donald Trump, he was a man that entered into politics uh, into the race, I should say, as uh, a man that who wasn't bought and paid for. You know, while I did not support, um, you know, President Trump, uh, nor did I support Hillary Rodham Clinton, um, he has become to the American society like an individual, like a, a breath of fresh air. Mm -hmm. And simply because he does not have to bow down to anyone. He was able to use um, his resources, the resources that he had on a personal level to run, and he didn't have to bow down, he didn't have to cow down to anyone. And so what you see um, and what I saw and what we see is we see the American populace um, wanting to see a politician that will do what he or she says uh, and follow through with it, not someone that is, is, is um, pandering for votes, and someone who says one thing, but then when they get in office does something else. And so um, I see him uh, as an individual who um, 
has the opportunity to do what he says that he came into office to do. Mm -hmm. And so that will ruffle a lot of feathers. And I'll say this, that because he's not a politician, because he is an outsider, he has an uphill road because he has to fix a lot of things that politics have broken. For instance, um, we look at some of the executive orders re as of recent. We see the, uh, the protesting and the demonstration about the, uh, the, the ban on the immigrants coming in from certain countries. Now, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan said this while he was running, and he said this, I think, on Alex Jones' show. When Alex Jones interviewed the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, he said that, um, and he said this on other shows as well, he said that there should be some vetting of immigrants that are coming in from these particular countries because in the name of uh, foreign interests, um, America has done some things in these countries that they know about, but the American people don't know about. And they have caused certain people to unite, whereas, see, you, make no mistake about it, the Muslim world was not united, and they haven't been united in, oh, in many decades. They haven't been united. But some of the things that have been done in the name of the American populace, in the name of freedom, justice, and equality, in these countries have been done, have united um, individuals that would have never united. And so they are feeling desperate and they are doing things um, that we see that are being done uh, to other countries. And uh, so it, it is when you know what you're doing to someone and in a, a country, when you are usurping and pulling out their natural resources and toppling their power, you should. When you create enemies, you have to do some vetting. Mm -hmm. And so um, it is only if you want to protect the American populace because of this, you have to do some vetting. So while we, you know, don't want to see the discrimination of Muslims and the non-discriminating of Christians coming from these areas, we understand that that has, has to be done in, in order to continue to protect the American population. So it's time to pay the piper. Absolutely. What do you think all these marches going on? Well, we, we have a and marches and mount, yeah. Well, we have a constitution, and uh, people are exercising their right to um, express themselves and freedom of speech, to freedom to petition their government, the freedom to gather. So, this is what we do in the United States. We we protest, uh, we petition, uh, we assemble, and we counter protest, counter assemble, and counter speech. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now, now what I'm seeing is, uh, and what I'm feeling, and what I'm hopeful for is, uh, as the election wound down mm -hmm. toward the end, mm -hmm. Trump kind of broke out Don King, and I think the Honorable Minister, Mr. Farrakhan, he he questioned the extent of existence of a, of a Obama's legacy, basically just saying. What did you do for us? And it's, to me, it's like a man who can talk to a Steve Bannon and can talk to a Don King, to me, he may have a better chance of actually finding some common ground. Or, it's hard to find, yeah, hard to find yeah, common ground with someone that you don't talk yeah, to. Yeah, or it's just the idea that after you are elected, and I think I have uh, some experience with that, you just want to reach across and uh, widen your, your net. You know, so um, I think that's smart. You know, it's, 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 it's very smart for any president to reach across the aisle and talk with people that you don't necessarily ag agree with, they don't necessarily agree with you, and didn't support you. Uh, I think that's why we have so much partisanship in, in this country right now is because you know, everybody just wants to, to talk and scream at each other in their, in their tribe instead of reaching across mm -hmm. and listening to some, listening to an opposing viewpoint, even if it's just to strengthen the viewpoint you have. Well, a lot of people are, seem to be just not even receptive to hearing someone else's point of view. And I think that that hurts. Well, absolutely. And I'll say this, that, you know, if the president of the United States of America 
Mr. Donald Trump wants for the black community to take him serious, we got to ask the question, who are you reaching across to talk to? The last time I checked in history, whether it be empirical, uh, uh, in, in, in our basic history, or whether it be in prophetic history, an entertainer has never freed a people or brought freedom, justice, and equality or equity, you know, to a group of people. So you reaching across to Steve Harvey and Jim Brown and some of the others arts and entertainers, I mean, on the surface level, you know, that, that seems applaudable. But if you're really serious, then some of the main stakeholders that have been doing this work for 30, 40, 50 years and have been serious about it, reach across and begin to dialogue with them. You know, if Donald Trump is really serious uh, uh, about reaching across the aisle, then why don't he reach out to the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan? If we really want to talk about race relations, if we really want to talk about doing something for the, because if we, if, we, if we say what's good for the black community is good for the community and what's good for the black community is good for the country and the world, you know, let us have a serious dialogue about the condition of our community and what the United States government can do to help because we were helped into this condition. Now we know ultimately we have the res responsibility to rid ourselves of the condition that we are in. But I'll say this, that, you know, I can't take him serious if his reaching across the aisle is to entertainers and, and not to politicians and not to entrepreneurs and not to, you know, real stakeholders in the community. While I can say, okay, that's a nice gesture, but if you're serious, then you need to reach across to some real people. Yeah, and I think Mr. Muhammad has a good point. And, and I've, I've seen Mr., um, I've seen President Trump reach out to the, the former uh, owner of BET, I think he's got a bigger conglomerate. Bob, Bob Johnson, he's reached out to him, uh, and there have been some other black entrepreneurs. So, I mean, Mr. Muhammad is is absolutely correct. I mean, if you're really serious about uplifting the economic plight of any people, well, you need to go to the people who are that have been through that economic plight and uh, you know know what that takes. So I think he's going to do that, and I, and I think he's doing that now. But you know, usually after you win an election, you talk to the people who, who are willing to talk to you. Uh, again, someone, someone who's been through elections, you know, after you beat somebody, sometimes they don't want to talk to you immediate, immediately. So you have to talk to the people who are willing to talk to you, but over time, Mm -hmm. uh, as people see that you're trying to be genuine, you're trying to reach across and, and help, you know, they will also want to come over and, and have that dialogue with you. Well, the thing that really, in my view, it seemed to me that Trump was the only one that talked about education, about school choice. And to me, school choice and education is very important. It is the key. And we know that public schools in the traditional sense, are not really working out. So why not try something? New? Well, let me ask you. Say, so when you say they're not really working out, I, my, my district in in rural East Texas, and I'm proud to represent five counties. Which one? Polk, Polk, Tyler, Jasper, Newton, Harton counties. Uh, usually, the the school district is the major social center of town. I mean, when you think about the development of this country, when you saw the development of a community or a colony they all had something in common. The church and the school were in the center of the community. Now these days, when you look at our communities, you look at a new subdivision, sometimes the church, and definitely not the school, is not even in the center of the community. It's on the, on the outer edges. And, and I think uh, Mr. Muhammad would, 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 would find some common ground here. You know, when you put those two institutions, you physically place them on the outer edges and then you wonder uh, why they don't get the attention that they should. But I, I bring that question to you because I, I talk with some education leaders today. And I'm talking as a member of the Texas legislature mm -hmm. that has a constitutional responsibility, Article 7, Section 1 of our Texas Constitution, to provide for this free public education and people say, well the, well, the schools aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, they're not, I, I look at my 26 school districts and, you know, you have from district to district, district, classroom to classroom, campus to campus, they all have their challenges. 
But when you look at $12,000 per kid, so I'm told, now there's some people out there don't think that's really, really out there, so this is an average, $12,000 per kid, and you divide that by the 183 statutory day school year, that comes out to $65 a day per child based on the mission that we give schools. Uh, I think all, you know, all in all, you probably find out that you're doing probably a, a fairly decent, if not great job. So I think, you know, when you go to some, maybe some of our schools in, in, in the more urban areas of, their, of our state, there could be some challenges there for, for a variety of reasons. But I, I, I really recoil at state leaders, uh, other state legislators, uh, statewide leaders, national leaders, uh, who just browbeat and point and say uh, that educators and students aren't getting the job done, mm -hmm. okay? So I'm, I always want to know what metric people are looking at when they say, well, schools aren't getting it done. I mean, what metric are they looking at? Okay. Now, I'm, Robert, I believe you work in education, don't you? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. What are your perspectives on that? My perspective is that the educational system in this new age that we're in in the United States of America is not living up to its standard that was set decades ago you know um and i'm and i and, and i not it's not a black or white problem it's an american problem mm -hmm. that you know when we compare you know our success rate to you know um developed uh, nations or countries around the world but let's just i mean if we if we compare texas to the other states um and we look at standardized testing now we know that they are politically driven um and so you can't use that as a, a single measuring tool to say whether we're being successful or not. But let, let we did a teacher training one summer, mm -hmm. and we used uh, standardized test scores, right? And we looked up and we pulled scores from uh, schools from around the surrounding districts and uh, from around the state. And no matter whether the school was a, a blue ribbon school, whether the school was an exemplary school, whether it was a, a, a failing school. Whenever we looked at the scores and we began to look at the scores demographically, mm -hmm. the Blue Ribbon, the, ex the, the exemplary schools, they always had a passing rate of European Americans uh, at 80 to 90 percent. When we looked at African Americans or black people, we had a passing rate in math uh, and reading of 30 to 40 percent. Latinos, just a little bit higher. And so it didn't matter whether the school was failing or whether it was passing. So that said to us that there was something wrong. But instead of only raising a voice about what's going on in the classroom, we said, let's take responsibility for the children that we have. Mm -hmm. And if we can take responsibility for the children that we have, then we can be a part of the solution and a part of the answer uh, uh, to, to this um, issue. The, the, the prison... The school to prison pipeline is a reality, it's real. And so when I look at the school over in Northeast Austin that um, was uh, realigned and, and it was it, it, uh, several, I think three times it was, renamed and realigned, I won't call the name of the school, but um, every day, at our little school was sitting across the street from it, but every day they had an officer on one end of the school, an officer on the other end of the school, they had an officer driving on a four-wheeler with a light ro roving on it, and you had to go through metal detectors. And every, when we first moved our school to this area, the first week of school, when these children got out of school, they spilled over onto to our property until this little guy here came outside and said, we're not doing that on this property. When you get out of school, you go around, and you don't come onto this property. Never had a problem with them at all. But every day, they had problems with the, with the students at that school, and so, there's a culture that exists, and it's, it's going to take a team effort. And if legislators and lawmakers are not on the same team as educators, you're going to always have the bumping of heads, and you're going to always have now, um, uh, when, when you look at the economy, when the economy's up, educators are in demand. When the economy's down, Educators are coming back to educate because the environment that I grew up in in school no longer exists. The teacher doesn't have this 
person-to-person -person relationship and know a little bit about your family and know a little bit about what's going on. And when you come to school and you're kind of off, they, they can pull you to the side and have a conversation with you and call mom and see what's going on. And so I'll say this, that if we want to compete, you know, if we want to bring jobs back from overseas, mm -hmm. if we want to get the proper and, and train our citizens to take these jobs, we're going to have to do a better job. And I'm not saying that the public school system has failed, but I will say this, that it is not doing the job that an educational institution should do. And I have to be careful when I say that because I was about to say it's not doing the job that it was designed to do, but I believe it was designed to train its citizens to come out and emerge from them, not to change the world, but to enter into the workforce. And the problem is, is when the workforce is not stable, then what are you training individuals in education for? So we have to, we have to, we have to think about a new educational paradigm. We got to think about We're this. We're talking about a new model. That's but, right. But, we we got to think about but, that. But, but let, let, let's, let's, let's anchor back on what Mr. Muhammad said. He said there was a time when the teachers knew a little bit about your background and they could get on the phone and call your parents. And, you know, we talk about all these other things. You know, the standardized tests, they're important. Let's, let's, let's get after it. We talk about the teachers, definitely important. That's a, that's a very important relationship, teachers and, and students. Uh, we talk about the, the security force, and that's what I say, the security force on these campuses. I mean, Mike, uh, a, a very, very disturbing statistic where over the past few years, we have more campus security than we have counselors. Right. on many of our schools so but I want to get back what why 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 don't we have a situation what why is it that the parents and the students are not talking I think that's something we need to rest on a little bit look you can talk about school choice vouchers charter school public school but at that primary institution the family is not involved with the school, the other institution, government, that's a breakdown. That's a breakdown. So you got to have the basics, and the basics is a family. I was, I was about to get on that issue because okay. to me it seems, for, for whatever reason, mm -hmm. in this country we, we don't have separate but equal facilities. We, have, we don't have separate unequal facilities. We have separate unequal families. Okay. Because I, it seems to me the, the structure of the black family has been... Well, the structure of all families. So you got to understand the family as an institution is under attack. You know, we said that there are three basic or three godly institutions. The family, the church, and government. Okay? And often I tell folks, you know, you know if, if the government is dysfunctional, well, the government is only a function of the other two, so it's the same people. So go look at yourself if you want to find the government is dysfunctional. You know, we come from the family too, right? Yeah. Okay. But you, 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 the, the family is under attack. The family is under transformation. <clears throat> and so, you know, we, it, it's great to talk about school finance, school funding. I think we need to do some work on that. Uh, it's great to talk about the, the, the you know, the, the, the um, uh, classroom, the prison pipeline, and I think I've tried to do some issues around that, but nobody wants to talk about the family. We want to talk about the teacher, and we should. It is if he or she is capable and qualified and certified and all that, but nobody wants to really delve deep in the family. Let me just get just quick before, before you. I, okay. I know you. You know, we've got this big old CPS drama going on in the state. Okay? Yeah. All right. Um, it's great to say we need to give CPS more money. We shouldn't have kids dying. We should be able, all of what's correct, but no one's asking the question, how do you rebuild and or strengthen families? Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to touch that. What you got to say about that, Robin? Well, I mean, you know, the, the reason that it, no one wants to touch it is because there's not enough interest in rebuilding the family. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we can sit here and, and, and not be rocket scientists, but, you know, 
live day to day in this society and we can come to the conclusion that the the attack on the family um, is producing what we see in our society, then not only can we see it, but other people can see it. You know, so, so and, and I'll say this, that when we're talking about educational institutions and we're talking about the success of the educational institution, see, there's a cultural piece that is a part of this as well. You know, when I see families where you have single moms or you have a mom and a dad, and in a city like Austin, you need two and a half jobs mm -hmm. to be able to make mm -hmm. it. But they're willing to put in that kind of work. But what happens is they end up sacrificing right. the rearing the of their children and the time with their children, which when I was growing up, and we moved from East Austin from Booker T. Washington housing projects to Northeast Austin in that area where the lower middle class families that were working for these manufacturing companies were buying homes and whatnot. Many of those guys that I grew up with went to prison as we became adults. Many of them went to prison. They had mom and dad in the house. Many of them had vehicles in high school. Many of them had the financial resources. Many of them had, they got college, they had college hours. They were able to go into college, but you know, the culture of keeping up with the Joneses and, and, and the fall of the manufacturing industry, you know, begin to pull mom and dad away into more work. And I'll say that the educational institutions, the spiritual or religious institutions, and the home are not independent of each other. Interdependent. They are interdependent. And the minute that we begin to separate them and cause blame and say, you're the problem, you're the mm -hmm. problem. See, when we emerged out of slavery, the first thing we built was a church. And I'm a Muslim, mm -hmm. but I understand the importance. I grew up in the church, you know. I was, a, I, was a, I was in the junior choir. I was a junior deacon. I was an usher. I was all of that, you know. So I was at church all the time. So I know the importance and my foundation of the church. And then we began to have schools. And those schools emerged out of the church that we were in. One little one room school and they taught grades kindergarten mm -hmm. or first grade all the way through the 12th grade and so we got to get back to the understanding that they're not independent of each other they're interdependent and if we're going to make it you know and i deal with families all the time and i find myself doing things and making home visits and and helping students uh get admissions paperwork in for college and just various things that maybe they don't get the support to do we find ourselves going from my little elementary school and having former students in high school where counselors won't give them the time of day and going and saying, no, you need to be taking this class. You need to be taking this class. You need to be taking this class. So the minute that we decide, okay, I know mom and dad got to put food on the table, but Uncle Joe or Auntie so-and-so uh, or, or Big Mama so-and-so, they have time to pitch in where I'm not able because I'm struggling to keep this roof over this child's head. And in Austin, it's very difficult yes, because yes. now I'm, I'm hearing that the homes that are selling here in Austin are the ones that are 250000 and up. Mm. And the ones that are 150000 are not even moving. Mm. And I'm like, well, who's buying them? And we know who's mm. buying them, people that are coming in from California, the East Coast, and all of these other places to take advantage of this high-tech industry. Okay. What kind of work is that? You run a charter school, don't you, Robert? Yes, sir. I'm a charter school. I'm an elementary school principal. Okay. You know, uh, I was talking with a group, like I said, of educational leaders today, Mike, and you know, they were a little dismayed. Um, and and we're going to have to get out of this in government. You know, when when state and legislative leaders come to a group of educators and say, you know, y'all aren't getting the job done. This is not, you know, you you know, you guys aren't, you know, bang, bam, 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 bam. You know, um, maybe that legislator needs to spend a day in one of those teachers' shoes. Okay, uh, it's it's you know it's pretty good to say it's pretty easy, I guess, to say you're not getting it done. You're not, you know, just imagine. You know, I was a football coach when I was as a public school teacher. Just imagine at every halftime, before every game, at the end of every game. You know, you're just pointing and telling the, the, the players and, and the and assistant coaches, you're not getting it done. You're, you're not out there doing this. You're not. It, sooner or later, the legislators, whether it's public education, CPS, transportation, any of these things, 
sooner or later we need to look at our sales. We are the ones writing the legislation, <laughs> telling people what to do. We are the ones uh, doing whatever appropriations, legislation, appropriations, maybe the teachers are doing what we asked them to do and we're not asking them to do what they really need to do or we just need to ask them what they need to do so they can do whatever needs to get done. Now James, you remind me of something that Jim Bowie told me once. Mm -hmm. He said, Mike, he said, remember when you point your finger at somebody, you're pointing three fingers at right. yourself. Right. I, look, I, I don't see any school board in Texas, any charter school board in Texas, any teacher in the classroom. Where, do, where does the teaching core get the curriculum for the public school? The State Board of Education. Who designs the test and pass out the test? The Texas Education Administration. Who writes the graduation requirements and the statutes for the schools and the school boards to conduct themselves? The legislature. Who appropriates? The legislature. Okay, so maybe it's all of us, if the, if the job isn't getting done, it's all of us not getting the job done. The educators, the legislators, the, 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 the school board members, the, the, the folks at the TEA, the folks on the, so on the state board. So it's not just any and, one particular Well, person. I think we need to get out of that. And, and, and I think as well, uh, you know, I'll reach out and I'll probably get some phone calls after, after this. But I think my <laughs> co former colleagues in the classroom need to stop pointing the fingers. I mean, I remember listening to Marva Collins, and everybody knows who Marva Collins is, right. the yeah. famous yeah. African-American uh, educator out of Chicago, I believe. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and someone started talking about, well, you know, the parents aren't doing this, you know, the mama is it. And she said, stop. Who taught the parents? We did. Yeah. So we need to get out of that. Exactly. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. It's all of us on the team, on the education team. So we have to pull together as a community in well, general. I, well, I think it gets kind of old. Um, uh, school boards show up and sue the state. State shows up and points the <laughs> finger at the school board. You know, legislators point the finger at the educators. Educators point the fingers at the families. Families point the finger at everybody. Right. Okay. We need to get out of well, that. And that's, and, that's, and that's what I mean. Is these entities are not in, in, independent. It, mm -hmm. It's a team. And if the team, you know, um, if the team can't function as a team, then you have no team. You, <laughs> it, you don't lose the game. The team, team loses, loses the I mean, game. And if this team loses the game, it's, then what? What does our workforce look like? What mm -hmm. does our leadership look like? Mm -hmm. What does our future look like? Because you, we are producing what's mm -hmm. coming out of these institutions, you know. And so um, that that's very important to me. Mm -hmm. And so. Now we have more degrees in our community than we did back in the 40s and the 50s. But when you look at our community, we're not, the, 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 the level of equity is not commensurate with the degree, with the rise in, in degrees that we had. So that was, a, I remember that was a thing that, that we're choosing the wrong degree plans, you know. Black kids are going to school and they're choosing the wrong degree. They're majoring in business and they don't know what to do with a business degree, you know. But again, you know, so, so one of the approaches is to stop blaming mm -hmm. and, and, and do, I think Booker T. Uh, Washington said, cast your bucket where you stand. There you go. And when you cast that bucket down and you decide, I'm going to make a difference from right here where I am. I don't care if I'm at the, at the bottom of the totem pole, I'm going to make a difference right here. And that's what individuals like Marva Collins mm -hmm. did. And these are our unsung sung heroes. And so, you know what? We can look at politics. We can look at the educational institution. We can look at the criminal justice system. We can look at all of these things. But when we decide we're going to take responsibility, regardless of the circumstances, then that's when we'll start winning. And, and when we start winning in the black community, yeah. that means the community <laughs> starts winning. That means America starts <laughs> winning, right? You back, you back on my <laughs> uh, James, are you still on the uh, criminal justice uh, committee? Well, uh, we don't know what committees we're on now. We're, you know, the House... Um, the unique nature of the Texas House of Representatives, we technically reorganize every session pending, you know. So um, uh, we did serve on those committees last session and the session before and the session before that, but we'll, you we'll know, see. We don't know where you're going to We don't, we don't right know now. where we're on now, but, you know, we'll, we'll see. How long is this reorganization process going to take? A couple of weeks? Well, we'll find out. Uh, that's, that's, all, that's all in the hands <laughs> of leadership right now. 
But uh, we're praying and we know that leadership is uh, approaching this in a thoughtful manner and, you know, we'll, we'll get there. You know, I was uh, at the grocery store the other day and I saw a Texas Monthly. It had mm -hmm. Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick on the front. Okay. And on the Texas uh, government system, does the Lieutenant Governor hold more power than the Governor of what? Well, I would say definitely during the session, the Lieutenant Governor plays a very important role. He's constitutionally the presiding officer of the of the Texas Senate and under the current rules of the Texas Senate, and again, I'm not a member of that body, the Texas mm -hmm. Senate, but we do try to keep up with their rules so we know what they're doing over there. But um, he's the presiding officer, he assigns committees, he will uh, prioritize legislation, uh, the speaker does uh, some of the same uh, uh, tasks. So um, he is a very important member because he does technically serve in both branches, the executive branch in place of the governor when, when need be, and, and obviously he has a very powerful role in the legislative branch. You know, what I'm thinking is, uh, I'm wondering, I know there's not a, a silver bullet solution. It's gonna take a bunch of people doing a bunch of things. If it was easy, it would already been done. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if it was easy, it would already been done. Okay. How you, what do you see solution-wise? Well, look. Because I, I, I don't, I don't want to sit and talk about problems. We know what the problems are. Right. Right we need to talk to them. So well, we focus on solutions. Well, on the well I, w when I approach a session, you know, you have all of these folks in your district around the state, and I even get letters from around the country. Uh, you, know, you know, we need to get this done, we need to get this done, we need to get this done. Uh, I'm not one to tell constituents their issue is not important. However, my focus primarily is how do we continue or create an environment where our entrepreneurs can continue or start to be that engine of economic prosperity in our local communities. Two, how do we transform our public education system in Deep East Texas where it facilitates that economic growth and that citizenship. And three, uh, how do we truly have safe communities? So that's where I, I start at. Now other people will come with other issues and um, you know they'll fit in where they can get in. But those, those are usually the three issues I really go in thinking about from day to day in the session. You know, uh, a couple of years ago when we last spoke, James, mm -hmm. just a, a couple of years ago, I believe, we said we okay. need to get into action. And you said something to me that has stuck with me a lot. Mm -hmm. You said, Michael, politics is about money and votes. Yeah. And I think about votes a lot. Mm -hmm. If you and have look, one, you can get the other. I'm reading this book by uh, mm -hmm. Dr. John Butler about entrepreneurship and self-help among black Americans. Mm -hmm. And I know that back in 1932, I think it said it was, there were 12 million African Americans. Okay. We've got about 13, 14 million now, and that's not much of an increase, which gets to me to one of my favorite issues to discuss, which is the issue of abortion and okay. protection of the unborn child. Okay. I just have a problem with that. Okay. And there's a, a clip I'd like to show, and then I'd like for us to discuss that, the, what's okay. on that clip. It's from Mafia 21. I think I. I may have texted to you, I yes, don't know how much of you had to write to read, but there's about six minutes uh, section that I, I'd like for us all to, to observe and then share, share our perspectives okay. on. And that these permits would only be good for one baby. But eventually, proposals like forced sterilization, chemicals in the food and water supply, and government control of childbearing were abandoned by most people in the eugenics movement. Despite the fact that many of them openly advocated such ideas, they would come to realize that there was really no practical way to carry them out. But for all their failures, what the eugenics movement had accomplished was to lay the foundation for the next phase of their plan. And this is where they would find the success that they had been chasing for over 100 years. What would you say is now the number one cause of death in the African-American community? Heart disease. Oh, HIV AIDS. Uh, diabetes. Cancer. Uh, AIDS. I'll say heart disease. AIDS. 
from what I heard, it's probably AIDS, you know. Probably heart disease. Um, I think heart disease. Oh. Uh, HIV. No. Gang violence. What if I told you the real answer was abortion? Since 1973, legal abortion has killed more African Americans than AIDS, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and violent crime combined. Every week, more blacks die in American abortion clinics than were killed in the entire Vietnam War. And the largest chain of abortion clinics in the United States is operated by Planned Parenthood. We have now reached a point in this country that African-American women, though they make up 12% of the population, they account for 37% of the abortions. An African-American baby is almost five times more likely to be aborted than a white child. The abortion industry at this point kills as many African-American people every four days as the Klan killed in 150 years. And you can truly say the most dangerous place for an African American to be is in the womb of their African American mother. All across America, you can stand outside of the abortion clinics and see a steady stream of black women coming in and out. But somewhere along the way, we got the idea that this is a white issue or a conservative issue or a Republican issue, and therefore, it's not an issue that we have to be concerned about. This same attitude has allowed Planned Parenthood and other members of the abortion industry to carry out this genocide right under our very noses. Right now, in America, about half of our babies are being killed in the womb. And in certain parts of America, more of our babies are being aborted than are being born. When 17,000 aborted babies were found in a dumpster outside of a pathology laboratory in Los Angeles, California, some 12 to 15,000 were observed to be black. Irma Clardy Craven, Chairman, Minneapolis Commission on Human Rights and Secretary of the Urban League. To understand what the agenda was behind the legalization of abortion, all you need to do is look at the statistics from the U.S. government. Studies from the CDC show that prior to the legalization of abortion, approximately 80% of all illegal abortions were done on white women. One study in New York even found that white women had five times as many abortions as black women. But at the moment abortion became legal, that began to reverse. And that's why the legalization of abortion was so crucial for the eugenics movement. Legalization created the ability to market abortion in the black community. And from a eugenics standpoint, that changed everything. These people cannot have it both ways. First, they say that birth control will reduce the number of abortions. Then they flood our neighborhoods with birth control clinics. And what's the result? Our abortion rate skyrockets. So either they lied about the fact that birth control would reduce abortions in our neighborhoods, or this is the results and the purpose they wanted from the beginning. At this point, I truly have the tendency to believe the latter. In 1973, the year abortion was legalized nationwide, Dr. Christopher Tietze produced a study on abortion demographics at the request of the Population Council, a New York-based eugenics organization. In this report, Tietze confirmed previous research showing that when abortion is illegal, the abortion rate is much higher for white women than for black women, but that this completely reverses whenever abortion is legalized. At the time he published these findings, Tietze was a consultant to both Planned Parenthood and the National Abortion Federation. Other researchers within the eugenics and abortion movements were also documenting that easy access to abortion clinics produces higher abortion rates in the surrounding area. 
and at least one expert discovered that having a nearby clinic is a bigger factor in the black abortion rate than it is in the white abortion rate. At the same time this data is being circulated, Planned Parenthood and the rest of the abortion lobby were in the process of locating the vast majority of their facilities in minority neighborhoods. Then in 1974, a study was released on population control that had been conducted by researchers at three major universities. By analyzing data obtained from Planned Parenthood's own records, they determined that the number one factor in deciding whether a county in the United States provided free or low-cost family planning services was not poverty, but race. The researchers said their findings seemed to support the contention of many civil rights activists that such programs are less intended to assist the poor than they are to control the growth of the black population. Birth control and abortion are turning out to be the great eugenic advances of our time. Frederick Osborne, founding member of the American Eugenic Society, 1973. The best way to hate a nigger is to hate him before he is born. Leander Perez, Louisiana State Judge, 1970. Two years after the director of Iowa Planned Parenthood had publicly attacked the state's eugenics board for not approving enough sterilizations, a bill was introduced in the Iowa legislature to legalize abortion. Despite having the support of both the state Republican Party and the state Democratic Party, as well as strong backing from the governor, the bill would be defeated almost single-handedly by the only African-American in the Iowa legislature. Proponents have argued this bill is for blacks and the poor who want abortions and can't afford one. This is the phoniest and most preposterous argument of all. I represent the inner city where the majority of blacks and poor live, and I challenge anyone here to show me a waiting line of either blacks or poor whites who are wanting an abortion. Iowa State Representative June Franklin, Democrat, 1971. From the beginning, it was obvious that racism was the driving force behind the eugenics movement. While it was true that from time to time these elitist and social engineers would toss a few lower class whites in among the feeble-minded and worthless who should be bred out of society, it was also true that they never seemed to include blacks among the best and the brightest who should be bred in. And at the same time, the country was being saturated with calls for population control and family planning. The facilities to carry them out were pouring into the black community. After all, no one was suggesting that there were too many white people in the world. And realities like those did not go unnoticed by early civil rights activists. For them, the reason birth control and abortion were being pushed was not a secret. Those whom we could not get rid of in the rice paddies of Vietnam we now propose to exterminate if necessary, eliminate if possible, in the OB wards and gynecology clinics of our urban hospitals. Jesse Jackson, 1971. Black people are the target of birth control, not because the ruling politicians like them and care about their economic equality, but because they hate them and can no longer use them in plantations and other cheap labor conditions. Muhammad Speaks, the Black Muslim Newspaper, 1970. I believe the entire question of abortions is just one more in the continuous series of events to eliminate the black population. Father George Clemens, Jet Magazine, 1973. The abortion law hides behind the guise of helping women, when in reality it will attempt to destroy our people. Brenda Heisen, New York chapter Black Panther Party, July 1970. The racist tells you to take birth control pills to kill, to murder life that might have existed if you had not. They are planning mass extermination of people they consider dispensable. Van Keys, Oakland Chapter, Black Panther Party, 1969. A true revolutionary cares about the people. He cares to the point that he is willing to put his life on the line to help the masses of poor and oppressed people. He would never think of killing his unborn child. Detroit Chapter, Black Panther Party, 1970. Who the hell is getting the pill? The Mexican and the Negro. Do you want to wipe us out? Cesar Chavez, 1967. 
On the day after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, a memorial service was held at Howard University in Washington, D.C. As mourners left the auditorium, they encountered about 600 people attending a rally outside. Several speakers were heard warning the crowd that population control was being used as a weapon of black genocide. Among the speakers who gave this warning was noted civil rights activist. I, uh, that is one of the, uh, I, I took that excerpt because one of the main reasons that I kind of drifted to the conservative side of the house as a youngster. I say youngster because I was 65 years old. Anyway, okay. uh, was because of this abortion issue, and to me it just seemed wrong. Okay. You're talking about a life. And when I look at the, the two political parties that we have, on which James, you started out your, your doctoral dissertation doing a study of two, two, two parties, didn't you? Not, not well, so, well, but sort I, of, yeah. I want to, okay. to pick that excerpt because it, it it's indicates to me graphically that if we're missing people, we're missing power. And to me, whatever political party, I don't care what your affiliation is, but the one that is going to give my people more power is the, is the, is the, uh, more opportunity is the one that I'm most interested in personally. How do you see that, Robert? <laughs> well, you know, um, being an individual of scripture, there was a decree of death set out during Moses' time and his birth 4,000 years ago, 2,000 years after he survived that. There was another decree of death set out during Jesus' time of birth. And 2,000 years after he survived that, there's still a decree of death set out in our community. And so it exists. And we, as members of the Nation of Islam, we don't agree with abortion unless the mother is in danger of losing her life mm -hmm. or in instances like rape or in incest or something like that. But we believe that the taking of the unborn life or the life that has not made it out to this atmosphere, but it is life, mm -hmm. that we could be getting rid of the next Moses, the mm -hmm. next Jesus, the next Muhammad, or the next liberator of our community. All of the answers, all of the prayers that our ancestors prayed, if we read scripture closely, they were always answered through men and women. They never fell out of the sky. They were answered through the hands of men and women. And so we don't get rid of life because life brings life. And so uh, uh, I am in agreement with what I just saw, and um, we have to educate our children. And I grew up in Austin, and incidentally, the only parent Planned Parenthood I ever knew about was the one sitting across the street from the only HBCU mm. in this city, and the first one on this side of the Mississippi. Mm. Really? And I always thought about that. Why was that Planned Parenthood right across the street? You, you know. Um, Mike, uh, back in 2013, we had a pretty uh, sensational and contentious special session on this issue. Mm -hmm. And sitting in my office, listening to constituent calls and reading constituent emails, uh, you know, weighing in from either side. And what struck me the most, Robert, was Many of the women that I spoke with concerning this issue, they felt compelled to seek an abortion because a man did not step up and be a man. Mm -hmm. So that part of that clip where it says, you know, you know, we need to be honest with both sides. Well, let's just be honest. I actually had a woman tell me that she would, you know, she, you know, gave me her reasons why she was for or against, I guess it was HB2. Uh, she said, you know, I would have taken the baby the term, but my boyfriend gave up on me. So 
when we look at this, I can I know I understand all the sensational historical accounts in in the um, in, in your clip there, mm -hmm. but I think men we need to step up. We are actually enabling uh, this issue. Okay. Yeah, you know I um, <clears throat> I've reflected on this issue quite a bit, mm -hmm. and uh, to me, I believe it's going to come up again in the not too distant future. And I believe that that's what this next Supreme Court appointment really is going to be about. I think well, I, I think it's right going to be right. always going to be an issue. That, you know, a lot of money on both sides, a lot of sensation and, and on both sides. So there's a lot of uh, motivation to keep it going. <laughs> but I also agree with Robert's uh, analysis in that we need to be more educated and informed on the issue in our community. Because I think it's more urgent that mm -hmm. we do so than the majority community. Yeah. And, and understand that is men, in many instances, we are driving the situation, okay. okay? By, you know, not stepping up and showing comfort, showing strength where, where need, need be, um, and not facilitating this. So again, I understand and I've read some of these same uh, historical accounts and, uh, but, but you know, you know, at the beginning it said, you know, African-American women, the, the most dangerous uh, place, for, place a for a child is in the African-American woman's womb, but how about the most dangerous situation is to be fathered by an African-American male? So we, we, we've got, a, we got some play in this got, too got now. Well, yeah, you got on up. And, and I would say we're not, you know, it's, it's not, we're not blaming male or female because mm -hmm. it takes two to tangle. That's right. And, it, and, it, and, it, and it's, we're, we're interdependent, we're inter Dependent. Yep. interdependent Dependent in this type of situation. And so education is the key. If we understood what we were doing when we were getting rid of that life. Mm. And, and, you know, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that 75% of his work was with the woman. And a nation can rise no higher than its woman. So that means the condition of the woman the, the condition of the nation is going to mi mirror the condition of the, the woman. woman. And so both sides have to be educated on how important it is. See, when people want children of destiny, they start before conception begins. Mm -hmm. And when they find that conception has happened, they've already been in the process. And I'll tell any young lady, before you lay down with a man, you better make sure that he's worthy of you opening yourself physically up to him and giving him your virtue. And if he's not, he ain't worth it because he'll do that and he'll walk away. And so, but it does take two. And so we got to do our homework and we got to educate our community on how important it is. And, and these are not just social issues where you want to lay down and sleep. It's not natural urges, but there's a life that has to be planned. I yes, also sir. want to mention this issue because it would give me a chance to plug something that Robert Muhammad is getting ready to, to, to advance, which is the uh, the One Hood Under God. Uh, is, is that a convention, gathering, convention? That's, or that's, it, that's the name of, of, of a special meeting that we're having this coming Sunday at the Carver uh, Museum and Multicultural Center in the Boy Advanced Theater at 10 a.m. this Sunday. We have one of our dynamic national speakers coming down. We've been, you know, working a program called Squash the Beef and dealing with conflict resolution, and it's time that we unite. And right. I think this is the right time under the administration of Mr. Donald Trump where, where we say we got to get our act <laughs> together and we got to unite as a community. Well, yeah. okay.